I'm Larry Fedorik. Welcome to a new episode of my weekly podcast. Later, that same life. If you enjoy this series, help me grow this podcast by sharing it with at least one friend. Season 2, Chapter 2. Water. Intergalactic intelligent space aliens are hovering above Earth in their spaceship and staring down at the planet through their binoculars. That's right, they only have binoculars. Somehow their society managed to conquer intergalactic space travel but fell short in this one area of simple magnification. Anyway, they're looking through the binoculars and one alien says to the other, How is a planet that is over 70% water mostly on fire right now? Good question, replies the other, but we'd better be getting back. And off they go. So we need to talk about these two areas. Why are there fires and why can't we put them out? Fire and water. Worsening wildfires are a direct result of climate change. So are many floods. Too much water here, not enough there. Recently, a United Nations science panel issued another dire climate warning. Red alert. We are on the verge of the point of no return. The report is not a repeat of a paper from a year earlier, but it sounds familiar because science has been warning us for the last 30 years. By the way, you know what else just turned 50 this year? Oh, mercy, mercy me. Marvin Gaye's Mercy, Mercy Me, The Ecology. Point is, none of this should come as news to anyone. Oh, things ain't what they used to be now, now. We are on the precipice, the edge of global disaster. And we have to start fixing things now. And by now... I mean, this afternoon. And one would think that that alone would initiate change. However, we live in a world where we have people on their deathbed saying, my last words are, I wish I took the vaccine. And others who won't even do that, even if their lives depended on it, which of course they do. So, space aliens, that's why the world is on fire. Fire is one of the first and most important forces in the history of humans. It needs three things to burn, fuel, oxygen, and an ignition point. Speaking of that, some of these wildfires may have been arson, some man-made accidental, but fires do start themselves, in a manner of speaking. Often lightning strikes, nature at work. What the actions of humankind have really done is provide the ideal conditions, the fuel, if you will, for fires to become wild, massive devastation. Man discovered fire. They didn't invent it. The controlled and intelligent use of fire is partly what separated us from the other animals, except, of course, those pesky fire-breathing dragons. But eventually we slew them. When we can't control fire, we're in trouble. I don't want to diminish the overwhelming issue of why we are on fire in the first place. But I've always wondered why we aren't better at controlling it. I believe this question is valid. Why isn't a planet that is 71% water not a lush garden of Eden? With rich vegetation growing everywhere. Enough fresh food hanging on the vines to feed the populations. No deserts unless we will them. No fires beyond our control. Well, I know what you might say. The first challenge is that most of the world's water is ocean. Planet Earth is 71% water, but only 3% of it is fresh water. And get this, only 0.5% of that is available to us. The rest is frozen in glaciers and ice caps, 
less and less lately, mind you, it's polluted or so far underground that no one wants to drill for it. With fire comes heat and light. That was essential to our survival. But even more essential to life is water. Most of the earth is water, and most of that is ocean. That's what we know. But here's what else we know. Pumping station, desalination, distillation, transportation. We know how to get the water out of the ocean. We know how to get the salt out of the water. We know how to make it potable and how to get it to where it is needed. We know how. We just don't do it. There are already many desalination plants around the world. The knock on them is that they use a lot of energy to reverse osmose the salt out of the ocean water. And they produce a lot of waste brine. But they are working on making them more efficient. Technically, we can make all the fresh water we would need for millennia. I love how easy it is to look stuff up today. Get this. The Earth has 326 million trillion gallons of water on it or in it. Plus, billions of gallons of water in various forms of precipitation fall from the sky every year. Now, the world is about 70% ocean, so how much of that water falls from the sky into the ocean? Uh, trick question, it's 70%. But remember, we will have this global initiative where we will turn ocean water into fresh water as we need it, right? Well, what do we need? In North America, an average person can use up to 100 gallons of fresh water per day. So it wouldn't hurt for us to cut down a bit. But the overall point is, lots of water, most of the planet, water. Hey, by the way, speaking of precipitation, I'm going to switch from gallons to metric here for a second, because in Canada, that's how we report the weather. It used to drive me crazy when I had a radio show and I had to report the weather and the rainfall. 5 to 10 millimeters expected. We got almost 15 millimeters on the weekend. We'll be right back. What bothers me? It's a linear measure of a liquid. I get why we do that. You know, how high is the water, mama? How deep is the snow? But it's linear. I always wondered how much water actually fell to Earth. I don't measure any other liquid in a linear fashion. Recipe calls for three centimeters of milk. I'd like 16 centimeters of beer, please. Oh, I know you used to be able to get a yard of ale, but, uh, you know, we gave that up. Now we just go for a pint. So I finally looked it up. No real big point here, except it's an interesting way to look at it. It might actually be helpful to understand the water. And metric makes it easier to do the math. <laughs> Here's the basis, and it's easy to remember. For every square meter, one millimeter of rain means one liter of water. So that's a square meter, one meter by one meter by one meter by one meter. It's like a large coffee table. One millimeter of rain, that's like a couple hours of light showers on a summer afternoon. That's one liter of water on that square. Big deal. But think about this. Take one square kilometer, so a kilometer that way, that way, that way, and back. That's like a small neighborhood. And let's say it rains all day and we get five millimeters of rain. A square kilometer is a million square meters times five millimeters of rain. Five million liters of water fell onto your neighborhood. The soil and the sewer system handled most of that. Good. Now, remember only a few years ago when we had those high lake levels, including Lake Ontario? Lake Ontario is almost 20,000 square kilometers, which is 20 billion square meters. And we got 50 millimeters of rain over just a few days. 
So that's an extra 1,000 billion liters of water added to the lake. I don't care how great you are, that's a lot to handle. Plus the rain fell on all the cities and towns nearby, and much of that ran into the lake. Because, you know, we've paved paradise and put up a parking lot. So no soil to act as a sponge. Water has to run somewhere. Water will always find a way out. I love numbers. I know that was a lot of math. But didn't it just get simpler to understand how easily a lot of rain leads to flooding? Your head is swimming. Did it not see the no swimming signs? But let's get back to the ocean. So let's say we made all this beautiful fresh water out of it. How do we get it to where it's needed? That one is easy. Pipelines. Canada alone has almost one million kilometers of pipeline running here, there, and everywhere. It's enough pipeline to go from the west coast to the east coast and back about 100 times. By the way, was that a good example? I'm asking, is it a decent analogy? Because so often the analogies they use in the media drive me nuts. Ridiculous. The fire so far has burned an area the size of Houston. I actually heard that one the other day. Sorry, that means nothing to me. Houston? Heard of it. It's a big city, so I assume you mean a large area. But uh, unrelatable. People in Houston probably couldn't tell you what that means. You know, Oklahoma City is about the same size as Houston geographically. You could have said that. They've used enough water on the fire to fill 10,000 Olympic swimming pools. Okay, I don't know what that means either. And I just watched the Olympics. Give me something I can use. I think their favorite one is when they have to do length. It's the length of three football fields. Well, I guess I can figure that one out. My favorite, and we all do this one, is generic. From here to Timbuktu. We don't know how far that is. We just think, okay, that's far. Unless, of course, you lived in Mali, you know, just on the outskirts. Going from here to Timbuktu. Back in about half an hour. Speaking of far, boy, that was a tangent. Where were we? Pipelines. Oh, that's right. We got pipelines on this planet from here to Timbuktu. Gathering pipelines, feeder pipelines, transmission lines, distribution lines. 120 nations in the world have a total of three and a half million kilometers of pipeline. Canada's individual number is big because we're so vast. These pipelines carry fuel. And believe me, I'm not suggesting repurposing them to carry water. I'm saying that when we have the will, we have the technology and ability to deliver liquid and gas to anywhere we want it to be. Not among these pipeline totals are every town and city's running water. A whole series of pipes, a delivery system to get all the water we want, hot and cold, at our fingertips. So the big point, we have the ability to get water wherever we decide we want it. Where is the will? Don't tell me there's no money in it. In modern society, we don't just do things to make money. We do things to save money money, and things so that we don't have to spend as much money. What is the cost of destroying entire towns due to wildfires, areas of wilderness the size of Houston, and times 10, and every year in California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Ontario, Greece, Turkey. Last year, remember, Australia almost burned down. Wherever there is fuel, oxygen, and ignition, wildfire. Hey, we got a fire started here in the forest in the mountain. Hey, no problem. Just turn on the sprinkler system we installed. It'll be out in eight minutes. I also had this idea for a satellite smoke detector and alarm. It orbits the Earth, and in the first sign of a forest fire, it'll notify local authorities. Well, you know, that may be a little far out, but a global sprinkler system? I actually think that could be realized. The current system sucks. 
We send men and women into danger with axes and a small canister of fire retardant. Bulldozers go in and move the shrubbery around. Oh, and we're going to attach this large bucket to a helicopter, fly back and forth from the lake. What is the price of all that? Not to mention human lives. Get water to everyone on the planet where it is needed and for whatever reason it is needed. Tell me there's no economic benefit to that. Come on. It's not a dumb idea. It's dumb not to consider it. Especially since we already know how to do it. We know how to get the water. We know how to make the water. We know how to get it where it's needed. And these aren't third world problems. There are communities in Canada who don't have access to fresh water. How about the people in Flint, Michigan? Pipe it in if you have to. Access to fresh water should be a basic human right. If you build it, they will drink. So reversing climate change before it's too late is huge. Extreme heat exacerbates this problem. But in the meantime, putting out the fires. Solved. Let's get to work. That is how we get water to where it's needed. I think it's a tougher job to stop the water where there's too much of it. If you remember that metric math... Europe got a lot of rain recently. Billions and billions of liters of water fell from the sky. Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Germany. Massive floods and washouts. Least affected was the Netherlands. Their history involves living with water. They have systems of dikes, canals, reservoirs, levees, runoff areas. Why isn't everyone studying and copying their system? Because as we've learned, these once every century events are becoming annual. I'm making this sound easy. It's not easy. I get that it's not. Paraphrasing JFK, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. By the way, I think he said that in Houston. To-do list in order of importance. Put out the fire. Begin reversing climate change. Get water to everyone, except those who have too much. Let's start digging some trenches there. And going back to last week's podcast, get out and vote. Because everything has become political, from mask wearing to wildfires. F that. Not voting for anyone who is going to be playing politics with my life and the lives of future generations. Oh, one last quick note on water, and this is easy math. 90% of people in North America, about 90% of the time, don't need to be buying bottled water. As we explore the universe, water has become the symbol for signs of life, life as we know it. Water on Mars, ooh, might there be or might there have been life? It is the simplest of liquids, yet for centuries it has baffled the chemist's mind to explain its properties. In its solid form, it will float on its liquid form. What else can do that? It is our universal solvent. It can easily dissolve and distribute nutrients. It can break apart bricks and mortar. And it's one of the few things in the world that everyone also knows by its chemical formula. H2O. The list of proverbs that philosophize about water is a very long one, but here's my favorite. Only in water. Can you truly learn to swim? Later That Same Life is a weekly podcast series written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedorik. A new episode every Thursday. LarryFedorik37 at gmail.com.